Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Then On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Hello and welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Siler. Arlene is not here today. Um, uh, before we get to our guest of um, housing and Habitat for Huma Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, uh, let's thank our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many others, including the Partnership for Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity. Uh, let's welcome uh, <clears throat> Zachary Watson. Zachary Ralph Watson of Central Vermont uh, Habitat for Humanity. Welcome uh, to April Dead on Air. What, for those of who don't know, what are the missions and goals of Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity? Thanks, Larry. Um, yeah, so Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity is a uh, 501c3, a, it's a Christian ecumenical nonprofit, and mm -hmm. uh, we build affordable housing. Uh, for home ownership. So we have a couple programs. We do home repairs for, um, we help with home access to help people stay in their home as they age. And we also build homes and rehabilitate homes uh, and work with income sensitive Vermonters in central Vermont to provide them with a home that is theirs uh, with an affordable mortgage. Okay. Um, as a Christian organization, our mission is to, is, um, is spreading the love of God and, and uh, by providing shelter for those who need it and our uh, vision is creating a world where everyone has a place to live. Now in terms of um, affordability you know obviously affording a home isn't an easy thing um, you know there are rentals uh, is it 30 percent of, of when if somebody wants a home through Habitat, is it usually 30% of the person's income? How does that work? That's correct, yeah. So in order, the, de the definition of affordable means that you are paying less than or equal to 30% of your income on your mortgage payment. So that includes um, your principal payment, which is the amount that you pay towards the actual home itself, and then your escrow, which includes your homeowner, homeowner's insurance, as well as your property taxes. Mm -hmm. And we make the home affordable by uh, giving a mortgage and that is uh, that fits the budget of our of our partner homeowners. Mm -hmm. Now I understand that. Um, uh, uh, can you explain what sweat equity? is? because if somebody can't 
really afford payments. I mean, yeah, they have to make payments, but what is sweat equity? Uh, uh, so Habitat for Humanity is a, um, it's not a giveaway program. It's a true partnership. Mm -hmm. And it's a partnership in that it, basically in exchange for the sweat equity, we provide this subsidized mortgage. Um, so it's what sweat equity is, is that the partner homeowner uh, agrees to work up to 250 hours on their home and those 250 hours can be um, you know, split up between friends and family. Uh, it can be being on the work site, hammer and nails and um, you know, hanging doors, things like that, uh, you know, unskilled labor. Uh, it can also be office work. Um, we work uh, to, to fit the needs of our applicants and our partner homeowners. Uh, we also require uh, that our partner homeowners complete an eight-hour financial wellness course through Downstreet Housing and Community Development. Um, and that's all designed, the financial wellness course as well as the sweat equity on the home is designed to help the homeowner be successful. So they understand their home that they're actually building. Um, and they also understand the tools and resources to help them be financially successful. Um, how long has Habitat for Humanity been around? And Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, I, you know, the, how long have you guys been around? So uh, Habitat for Humanity was started in 1979 um, by Millard and Linda Fuller, uh, who are our founders. and. Um, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity started 10 years later in 1989. Mm -hmm. And, um, okay, so let's get to new projects. Um, you've been on before, but um, what are some of the new projects that um, Habitat for Humanity, Central Vermont, is working on? Well, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on right now. Um, and uh, we, so we just finished a rehabilitation of a 100-year-old house in Barrie mm -hmm. to meet high-performance energy standards, which means it's going to be really cheap to operate that house because it's um, energy efficient. Yeah. So we just finished that in March. Um, and we just closed our application period for um, I know you had one in Randolph. Or yep, you know. so we are building, we have a property in Randolph. It's on Central Street in Randolph. Um, it's between 39 and 43 Central Street. And um, it's, so we just closed the application period to find our partner homeowners for that. We will select our partner homeowners sometime in October. Um, that property we can build a single house on or we can build a duplex on. If we built a duplex, it would be our first duplex, which is very exciting. What's a duplex? Uh, duplex is, um, it means two, so it's, two, it's a two unit household, and there are different ways that you can kind of arrange a duplex. Um, for us, we focus on the privacy and, uh, and separation. So we basically, ours are uh, side by side uh, townhouse, where there's just a shared wall, but you have separate entrances, separate driveways, separate yards. Everything is separate except for the shared wall. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the type of a shared wall. It, what would that mean in terms? Uh, it's just the wall that's between. Uh, so you've got one unit on the right and one unit on the left, and there's just a wall down the middle that that's their shared wall. Okay. okay. <clears throat> now, uh, it, what are some of the myths around owning a home? that people shouldn't be scared of? Is there anything that you want to add to that? Because I know it is scary to own a home. You, you have a lot to do within that. Yeah, I. you know, um, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about that too much. I think for some folks, the fear might be that when you own a home, you're kind of stuck somewhere. Um, and and especially you know um, if there's subsidized housing where we subsidize a mortgage and we create some res restrictions so that our houses remain forever affordable um, some folks are afraid that if they take this house they might be stuck there and that's you know it's like anything else um, you know you're not forced to do anything and but uh, and, and people can always leave and, and sell their house, and that's the nice thing, and that's the difference between a rental and home, owning a home is that uh, you can be someplace for five years, and where if you're paying rent, 
um, that rent is going to your landlord and you don't ever see that money again. Where um, if you own your home and you're paying a mortgage, that mortgage payment is going to you. And so that when you resell the house, uh, you get all that money back plus um, the appreciated value of the home, which is how much the home has increased in value since you bought it. For those it. that don't know, what is it appreciate? Because, uh, you know, appreciate and, and de-appreciate. Because, for example, if a person buys a car, the minute you take it out of the dealership, it loses depreciation. So what does that, those words mean? Yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. So a car lo loses value as soon as you drive it off the lot. Um, a house almost always will appreciate in value, and that means that it gains value over time, and, it, and it's typically connected to the, to the market, to the, the, the economy, and our economy is um, almost always growing. But um, it's very rarely that house values lose value. Um, they, they typically either um, gain value very quickly or sort of stagnate. Um, but yeah, so a house is a great investment um, because you typically will see a, um, almost a guaranteed return on your investment um, plus what you've in invested in it. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, that's why home ownership is, is a good way of helping bring low-income people uh, out, of, out of poverty in, in to create middle-class families. Okay, now, I'm going to mention this only a small smidgen, but years ago, back in the 60s and 70s, there was something called NIMBY, which means not my backyard. Um, you know, we have people um, with special needs or people of color um, weren't allowed really to rent you know, the, the, it, people were afraid or something like that. What are some of the um, misconceptions around, you know, people with special needs in housing, if you want to bring that into the, the question? Well, I do want to preface, too, that I think... Um, you want to educate people here. Yeah, I, I think there's been... I think NIMBY, the term NIMBY, not in my backyard, um, it's used pretty broadly uh, on a number of issues. Um, for me, when I talk about NIMBYism, um, it usually means that somebody knows that housing or energy or a park, something like that, needs to happen. Th there's, a, um, there's a documented need for that project to happen. And that person knows that, but, um, but they say, yeah, I get it. Um, but I just don't want it in my backyard, put it in somebody else's backyard. So it's, and that's why it's not in my backyard, because when you say not in my backyard, it means I want it in somebody else's backyard, but not mine. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of, you know, I, I can talk about NIMBYism around Habitat for Humanity. Yeah. Um, you know, we work with uh, low, income, low income people, and um, there are, concerns sometimes by neighbors that you know they understand that we need to create housing for low-income people and that they need to be able to afford to live in a house but they don't want it in their neighborhood because they're afraid that um, it this low-income household might bring down their property value or they're afraid that low-income people will bring uh, unwanted things to their neighborhood and um, this generally doesn't happen. I mean, there's, uh, and then I assume this, the, basically there's, these are misconceptions that people have um, that lead them to this fear, and it's, and it's mostly fear. Um, so, uh, you know, that's what we run into, but we don't have, in, in our experience, um, our ha Habitat for Humanity homeowners, they own their home which means they're invested in that neighborhood. Oftentimes the neighbors are involved building the house or actually come to the house blessing ceremony. So we get to build that network of support with that homeowner and that helps them be successful as well. Mm -hmm. um, but their kids go to our school, they pay their taxes, um, they're invested in that specific street and the city's infrastructure, the municipal infrastructure. Mm -hmm. These are true community members. Um, and so I, I, I think in, for the most part, uh, people are, are excited um, and, and have appreciated the relationships that they build with the partners. What are some of the, uh, you know, I mean, you have construction people, you have um, or construction companies, you, 
uh, what are some of the um, sponsors or how does Habitat for Humanity get the money for these houses? Is it basically donations only or how's that work? Well, so when um, we are a non-traditional mortgage lender, which means that, oh, okay. which means that we uh, originate and service our mortgages. So we, we put forward the capital, um, uh, the money to build the house. And then we create the mortgage for that homeowner. So you put the money up front, and then and then the sweat equity people. Oh. Yep. And so when our homeowners pay back their mortgage, and through through our mortgage program, we have a zero percent interest mortgage. All the money is go that they pay is going directly towards their house. That money that's paid towards their house is put into a revolving fund, and those funds are used to help build our next house. Um, the, the it, all the, you know typically that is not enough money to build an entire house so we uh, we get subsidies through the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board a mortgage subsidy um, Vermont Housing and Conservation Board VHCB are fantastic partners what about um, housing urban development HUD HUD so HUD uh, there are some HUD programs uh, like home um, and the housing preservation um, fund and uh, trust fund and the housing trust fund. Uh, there are some um, sources of federal funding that are available, um, mm -hmm. and homeowners can actually access a mortgage through the USDA 504 grant or loan program to make it accessible. Because yeah. 504 makes things accessible. Uh, it, it can be, yep. Yeah. Um, so there are some. We we have not used HUD funds in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, but yeah, we mostly work with VHCB. Um, we get support from National Life, uh, from the Vermont Mutual uh, Insurance Company, um, Vermont Transco. Uh, we get a lot of community support from our businesses, and then a lot of individual donors. So we have uh, um, over a hundred individual donors that help us every year, um, and then we get grants and, and sponsorships from local businesses. So um, in terms of the meetings that have been happening recently and you have other stakeholder meetings. Explain a little bit about that and how people can get involved. Yeah, so you asked me earlier what other projects we had and I yeah. mentioned Randolph, so that's what we're working on now, but um, we've been working on uh, a larger housing development project here in Montpelier, Montpelier on Northfield Street and uh, it's about 50 acres and we are Right, ne right across from Econo Lodge. Right across from the Econo Lodge, and it's a rural um, vacant parcel right now. And uh, we received a community development block grant from the Vermont Community Development Program of fifty thousand dollars, as well as ten thousand dollars from the Vermont Housing Conservation Board to conduct a architectural and engineering uh, development feasibility study. Explain what. A feasibility study. Yeah, so basically, we're gonna we're looking at um, what are the geographic and um, cultural constraints and opportunities on the property. So, um, where where's where might there be wetlands? Where might there be steep slopes? Um, what is the soil condition like? Um, all those things that help us determine where and uh, and how many houses we can build. Um, and then a big part of this is also. Um, we have to build a street up to it, so we have to figure out the street access. And then, anytime you're building houses um, or streets, uh, you know, cement is an impermeable surface, which means water doesn't penetrate, doesn't get into it, so it stays on the surface and runs off. And so, anytime you do that, you have to do stormwater mitigation plans, and that means um, how do you capture all that additional runoff? So, um, we're, that's the feasibility study, and ultimately, is going to help us determine. Um, how much, how many units we can build, and and how much it's going to cost to put in all the infrastructure, that will help us determine essentially how what is the pre-development cost for each one of our housing units, and if it goes above a certain number, then we will say, well, it's not really feasible to do this. We can't do it, and so we won't. But our goal is to to make it um, feasible um, by, you know, working within with the community. So. We <clears throat> held our first stakeholder meeting last night, Thursday, the second. And a stakeholder for this project is um, community members, it's our neighbors, it's um, 
uh, individuals in our community that have special interests, like accessibility for um, people with, with special needs, um, and, uh, but also the homeless and, um, and moderate income, higher income, private developers. So it's, it's a sort of energy efficiency, passive house institute. It's everybody that might have a stake, an interest, or in this, in this development. We invited them to the stakeholder mm -hmm. meeting to share their thoughts about it and what they would like to see. And um, we had about 25 people there last night, and we had a really strong discussion. And we learned a lot from our community, a lot that we didn't think about before. And, um, and we went in with a blank slate. So we, Yeah, one yeah. of the things that was raised, and, and I know this is going to air uh, soon, but one of the things that was raised at that meeting, for example, um, since you're not too far from the O'Connor Lodge, there's um, forest there. And one of the things of building this, um, the new development that people raised was um, sometimes people walk through people's backyard. How's the security going to um, change? Is it going to be gated or... or are you going to have like a, a, I wouldn't say a gate around it, but like a perimeter where people can't, you know? So it's a security thing with, between the, um, how, how, how would this be, now this, it's 50 acres. So how would this um, really work if, um, in terms of the wildlife and all of that? Uh, so. I might phrasing it right. No, no, that's a, so. Um, there will be there I, I think some so it's the responsibility of a private landowner to post their property if they don't want people walking on it yeah um, and that's one of the beautiful parts about Vermont is that we have a, uh, a beautiful forested landscape yeah. and um, and a lot of Vermonters traditionally have not posted their land um, and that has allowed for the proliferation of hunting and um, outdoor recreation. Mm -hmm. So that's a really positive part of, um, of Vermont. Um, currently, the property is private, um, but the landowner has not posted it. Um, and as a result, a lot of the neighbors use it for their uh, own personal recreation. Um, so ultimately, if somebody in a butter doesn't want I mean, it's not likely that somebody would walk through somebody's backyard anyways. Um, um, no, but, I mean, I'm just saying that's... Yeah. Uh, I'm saying it, it was raised. The question was raised. Yeah. Um, it's. I mean, that seems... If somebody has a maintained lawn, that there's. it seems very unlikely that somebody would go through that. But if somebody is really concerned about not wanting people in their backyard, uh, then they would, um, they would, it would be their responsibility to post it. Um, but their, uh, you know, the park that we'll be designing as part of this housing development will have uh, designated parking areas and um, it's not going to be a free for all. But, and, and, and I think all you have to think about is other parks. How does another park work? And, and, and it's pretty clear that. <laughs> um, so, what are the, um, the misconceptions now, people with special needs having their own housing. What are the misconceptions around people with special needs when it, you know, it comes to renting or, I mean, in, in your own opinion, it, when it mm. comes to renting or having a house? Or? You know, I really can't talk to that, Larry. I'm not sure. Um, okay. I, I can tell you that we build, uh, we design our houses to meet the needs of our partner homeowner. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we select somebody that um, has mobility issues, uh, we partner with somebody that has mobility issues, we will design the house to meet their needs. Mm -hmm. um, and usually that means creating houses that are universally accessible. It means having doorways that are wide enough to get a wheelchair through. It means having hallways that are wide enough to have a wheelchair through. It means having ramp access up to the, up to the house. Um, and it means having you know, pull bars and things like that in the bathroom. So mm -hmm. we, we design our houses to meet the needs of, um, uh, of our partner homeowner, and, and, and that would include people with, that have mobility issues. Okay. Um, talk, um, what was one of, the, one of the main reasons why, now I know Central Vermont, but one of the, what, what was the main reasons why Habitat for Humanity formed years ago? 
Um, when, so when Linda, Linda and Millard Fullard started the organization, um, like I said, we're a Christian organization and they, it was their Christian ministry uh, to build housing. So they were pastors? Uh, they weren't, I don't believe they were pastors. I believe they were um, a couple of individuals that realized there was a need for providing shelter for low-income families. Mm -hmm. And uh, they came up with this, they, they felt a calling to do this and um, they, uh, what they designed was a was the current program, and it's pretty simple. Um, you partner with somebody that's low income. Uh, for us, that's um, thirty percent to eighty percent of area median income, based on your ha household size. And then you work with sweat equity and volunteers to keep the cost of construction low. And as a nonprofit, we can also receive donated materials. Mm -hmm. um, and then we offer a low interest or 0% interest mortgage to that homeowner that's affordable, means less than 30% of their income. And then those mortgage payments are recycled into. So, um, so a you mentioned fund. recycle, recycled um, goods and services. So, uh, wood, uh, uh, nails, all of that would be donated by whom? By, by They're not always donated. We purchase a lot. We're invested in our community. We typically, we spend anywhere between one hundred and fifty dollars and $200,000 out of pocket for our um, mm -hmm. houses. Mm -hmm. And then we might receive somewhere between twenty dollars and $50,000 in donated materials. Okay. Um, so talk a little bit about, um, I know you can't speak a lot about it, but Jimmy Carter's um, former, former president, Jimmy Carter's, um, uh, you know, invested time in Habitat. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, again, can't talk too much about it. So Habitat for Humanity is a um, international organization. We are probably the most well-known international housing organization in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, you know, we're in 70 countries, all 50 states. And I would say the reason we are very well-known is because of the work of uh, of uh, the Carters mm -hmm. um, because they have been invested and basically come and even at his age he is coming and working on Habitat houses every year mm -hmm. um, and he brings money and he brings promotion of our work and uh, um, he's just been a fantastic ally in, in our in our work. Okay, uh, what are some of the future goals? I mean we have some time left. But what are some of the future goals of Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity? Yeah, our goals are um, to make this housing development work. Um, we uh, we would hope to build maybe 100 plus units up there. Mm -hmm. um, this will give us uh, of the new site at the new site in Montpelier. Um, this will give us maybe up to 10, 10, 15 years of, of work uh, for us to do, and that's a lot. And so part of that effort is um, is we're going to need to build a lot of infrastructure that will cost millions of dollars and so we will be doing some uh, we'll be needing a lot of support from our local businesses and individuals to help us raise those funds so we can build streets and water infrastructure and stormwater infrastructure and um, sidewalks parks things like that so uh, we'll be uh, requesting lots of support from our communities and businesses so that's that's the big thing on the horizon right now um, we have been expanding our home repair program or um, home preservation program mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're doing six projects right now in central Vermont mm -hmm. building ramps primarily mm -hmm. uh, but Ramp, ramps for houses for people with disabilities yeah handicap accessible ramps exactly mostly it's for el uh, elderly individuals um, who would like to stay in their home they want to age in place uh, so we're expanding that um, and we also have been developing a neighborhood revitalization program for Barrie. Uh, in Barrie City on Blackwell Street, it's neighborhood revitalization. It uses an um, asset-based community development model or uh, quality of life, life foundation, quality of life uh, foundations as the habitat model. And uh, what it does is it basically works within the community it empowers them to think about their assets and their limitate and their needs. Mm -hmm. And then we, we work with them, we help facilitate the process for using their assets to fill the needs. So you've, um, you, you have this, like a, an example would be you've got a blighted 
uh, blighted house or, or a pl place uh, vacant lot, but the, you also need a park. So you go and you clean up that vacant lot and you create a park mm -hmm. uh, or put some community gardens in there. So um, that's, uh, that's a big goal we're looking towards. Um, and that's, again, it's about empowering our community uh, to create what they, what they envision uh, they need for themselves. Now, in terms, okay, so the house that was completed in Barry was a hundred year a hundred year old house. Has there ever been a project where um, you couldn't do or you had problems doing because um, you know um, because of the how old the property was or a problem you know it's hard if it's a historical landmark for example mm -hmm. go ahead. Uh, yeah, that's, um, it all has to... How does that really work? In well, we, we do a cost analysis before we take on a project um, to determine how much it will take to acquire the property, um, permit it, um, and then how much it will cost, and cost to build the house. And all of that needs to fit within our current financial model. We do subsidize all of our houses for our homeowners, but um, if we, we try to stick as close to to what it would uh, to what the actual mortgage will be um, in terms of how much we spend on it uh, so we looked at uh, the pink lady in Williams not pink lady um, the Rosewood Inn in uh, Williamstown and that's uh, I believe that was early 1900s it was built by the guy that owned Rock of Ages um, and it was designed to look like a Mississippi River steamer and it had been basically abandoned for the last couple of years, and it, uh, or I would say 20 years, and as a result, it was really run down. But it was beautiful, it was a beautiful house. So we went to it, we checked it out. Um, we figured it would cost about a million dollars to preserve the building. Um, and we, then we thought, okay, uh, that's a lot, but how many units do we need in there to make it so we could spend that amount of money on preserving it? And we figured we could put about four units in there and, and make it make it pencil out. Um, it, we would have converted it into a small condo association, if you will. Um, have you guys ever built condo? Never built anything like that. But the problem was that um, you know it's not only cost, so we could make the, the pencil out cost-wise, but we are also looking at what are the services that are available locally. And um, what will the impact of this be on this community? So Williamstown is pretty small, it's pretty rural, um, and there aren't a lot of services there um, that a lot of uh, low-income people need, like public transportation. And, and medical. And medical, exactly. So um, in the end, we decided not to move forward to the Rosewood Inn property because of the costs. The, and the Rosewood Inn was like a, it was, so it was a, a hotel? Or? It was a pre previously it was an inn and restaurant, yeah. Oh, okay. And it, before that, it was somebody's um, mansion house. Mm. Um, but yeah, so we decided that it um, didn't make sense for the community, and uh, and and ultimately that was driven by the cost. And so we decided that we couldn't move forward with that project. Okay. Um, now utilities, in term, you know, heat, hot water. Okay. When people rent. This is an example in Montpelier. Um, utilities are usually included in the rent, but in terms of habitat for humanity, how does how does that work? Do you help? Does your organization help people? Okay, you give them a mortgage, but does your um, organization help people get their utilities, heat, and hot water? Because it's expensive in the winter with heat. How does that work? Do you help them keep? utilities low as well we don't um, so as a homeowner that's the homeowner's responsibility yeah I, I, um, it to pay for their own utilities but what we do help with is that we build um, energy efficient homes mm -hmm. um, so it's it's less expensive to heat and cool the home and then we uh, so we make them very airtight and mm -hmm. well insulated and then for actual heating and cooling we use um, heat pumps um, which are very efficient, and so that means that you're um, basically you're not needing to buy oil, heating oil. You're using your electricity for heating, but they're also very efficient, so you end up saving a lot of money on your heating and electricity. Um, and we actually built a passive house 
with solar in East Montpelier. Passive, what is that? Uh, passive is a standard, is an energy efficiency standard. Um, it's more energy efficient than high performance. Mm -hmm. um, and so passive, because it was passive and it had solar, basically the cost of heating and electrifying this home um, was, was zero dollars per month. Um, the only cost is maybe the solar panels, which I'm not, I can't remember if the homeowner bought those or if we provided those. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, the same resources exist for a homeowner that exist for a renter. So you can still get fuel assistance from the state. And, um, from, and right now, uh, I believe there's economic services, they give economic you. services. And right now there's a Vermont homeowner assistance program, um, which helps people who are behind on their utility bills and things like that. So there's uh, all those services still exist. We don't um, we don't duplicate those services. What, what do you mean by not duplicating? Uh, we, we don't uh, we don't provide additional assistance for you uti for utilities. Okay, well, uh, we would like to thank you for joining us on this edition of Able Then On Air. For more information on Habitat for Humanity Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity's work, you can go to www.centralvermonthabitat.org. That's www.centralvermonthabitat.org. And if you want to find out more information on Ableton On Air, you can go to www.orcamedia.net. That's O-R-C-A-M-E-D-I-A dot -E net. I'm Lauren Seiler. Arlene's not here today. See you next time on the next edition of Ableton On Air. See you next time. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press, Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Then On Air has been seen in the following publications, Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England Chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.